Hey, what's up, fellas? We're back out here at White Sands Proving Grounds, and today's video is on the subject of castable refractory instructions. I do a lot of castable refractory work, and there's not a lot of instructional information online about how to cure a refractory. So in this video, we're going to be taking a look at some of those details, how to make a very cheap, effective form release agent. We're going to be talking about forms themselves. And I've got some actual instructions from a castable refractory manufacturer with their suggestions. And also a lot of details that I've cherry picked from the internet regarding curing concrete. It's actually not a drying process. It's not. In fact, you don't want to let it dry until it's done curing. We're also going to take a look at electrical heating for the initial dry out phase to maintain complete control of temperature increase. One of the most important rules in castable refractory is getting the water content right. And you can follow the instructions on the side of the bag, but they even say after that to add a little bit of water if you need it to get the flow to where you want it. But I do what's called the slump test, which is where you make a ball out of the refractory and you throw it like 6 to 12 inches in the air, they say, and you catch it. And it's supposed to slump in your hand just a little bit, but it's not supposed to just liquefy into nothing. You are supposed to be able to make a ball out of the material to determine whether or not the consistency is right. And that makes for some extremely hard refractory. If you make it too wet, it's going to end up being soft because of the voidage. It won't use up all the water, and there'll be cavities in place of that liquid voidage. Another one of the major breakthroughs and the discoveries throughout all my research concerning the curing of concrete and castable refractories is the fact that the process of making a castable refractory object is not a drying out process. When refractory is curing and setting, it's not drying. In fact, you don't want to let it get dry until it's cured. A lot of guys will spray water on it, they'll keep wet burlap over it. And there's even this thing called um, flood curing where they'll set up dikes of mud or dikes of dirt or whatever around a concrete pad and they'll flood it with a foot of water and let the concrete cure under a foot of water. So it's not a drying process. And when you learn that, you can come out with some castings that don't have any cracks at all. Now, when you fire cure it and you put some heat on it, you are likely to get some cracks due to something called asymmetrical force loading caused from the volumetric thermal expansion of the material. So that is going to happen, but nonetheless, those two things alone pretty much was a game changer. Learning how to get that water consistency right and um, the fact that concrete curing is not drying. It's, it's a, a chemical reaction taking place. All right, so what we got right here is some um, 60% alumina castable refractory. This has a 3,100 degree operating temperature. Just so we have it on file. Here is some of the water percentage for the mixing. As long as you got that first one there, you're good. But this is a really good product here. And that's what I used in this particular device. Just about done. I gotta put some labels on this thing and I gotta finish up on this rat's nest in here. A lot going on in there. And I gotta calibrate all the timing yet. So what we have here is a inch and a quarter pad of sand that I'm gonna be setting my forms down on so that we get a nice even weight distribution. I don't want any warped concrete. All right, we're all set up in our sand. Had to do a little Bondo work to this trough because it has a curved plane in there. You can't put a straight panel through when one end has an angle of this and the other angle is this. That requires the sheet to twist. You see here we got two different hips, just like when you're doing a roof or two different gable pitches. You can't combine two different gable pitches with a flat sheet without putting a hip in there. So we've got kind of a hidden center hip slope in the middle of that. Baby oil. 
with one container of Vaseline. And we're gonna do a little painting here for some concrete or for some concrete form release. All right then. Three hours later, now we're gonna let this set. One of the things that I want to tell you guys about setting refractory is it's not a drying process. It's a setting process. It's curing. We don't want to let it dry. If you let it dry out before it cures, you'll get big cracks in it, kind of like the types of cracks you see in, in a drought. So what we're going to do, keep an eye on this for a little bit. We're going to spray some water with a spray bottle over the top of it to keep that top wet. Then I'm going to get some garbage bags, some large garbage bags, and cover this up. So I'm going to go take five, just giving this thing a little spray so it doesn't dry out before I get back. Just enough to keep the wind from blowing on it from the fans and stuff in here. That'll stop any surface cracks from forming. So we'll go ahead and start the clock at 24 hours. So guys, one of the biggest things that I learned in this particular casting is that you cannot go off the 24-hour curing schedule that's written in the instructions they give you. Sometimes it takes longer than 24 hours before you can break those forms off. I've seen as long as a week. All right, so there we go. Here's that hip I was talking about. That's why I had to bond to this, because we have two different pitches on this gable. For a sheet to go from there to there, it requires it to warp to the new pitch. Start off at a pitch here and it slightly warps to match this pitch here. You can't make a rigid sheet do that. That's why you see this right here. We had to match the pitch on this side and match the pitch on this side, split the difference in the middle and then bondoed over the hip. It's about 36 hours later. We're gonna go ahead and try and pull this form off. Okay, the plan was always to grind these out rather than make a complex beveled round piece. I'm just going to grind these uh, portions here out to the spec they need to be. I did leave some air bubbles in this because I want some more insulation. My form pulled this piece loose on me though. It's still a little green. You got to erase this. So I'd show this is how I come up with the design anyway. Still gonna chop these side corners out once it's been fire cured. I don't so I might have to repatch that area, reform it after we get everything else cured. I'm not gonna stop for this one tiny area. We may just put a little patch on that. I think we'll probably be okay. I had a jagged edge of glue on my form that was cleft up in here in a staple. And it ripped that off of there. When I removed the form, so I should have been a little bit more gentle with the form work. But our next move is to get that form off of this one, get it on top of this, and we're going to start off with some electric heating. To throw in an electric heating module here. So the point is, we can calculate delta H associated with this process pretty readily. This is what we're going to start the heating process with. All right, so the refractory ended up freezing on me a little bit. It was really cold the other night, and I had some issues. We had a retarded um, curing process. So the refractory did not cure as planned, but we're going to be okay, I think. I've got an electric heater. I have one of these modules inside of there. We have four thermal couples in place. We're currently only putting 500 watts into it. It will only do about 950 on this voltage. I'm at about 1,000 watts right now. Hottest probe is at 245 degrees. And we can take a look at that right in here. I'm really digging that heating element. It's actually a resistor. It isn't made to run like that, I don't think. But we're using that to get the first little portion. We don't want to overheat it with water in it still. That's a dangerous part of the cure, so that's why we're using electricity. This is where we are in the curing process. 
I did an initial dry out with electric heat because it's so convenient and easy to do. I brought it up to 212, kind of held it there for a while. Slowly brought it up to a boiling point of water. Let it hold there until it started making some noise and then brought it up to about 344 degrees with the electric heat. So putting this bag in there is gonna do two things. It's gonna keep the wind from blowing on it and drying it off, obviously. And it's gonna keep the humidity inside that section high enough to where any evaporation is just not gonna happen. All right, so I let this set for about 40 hours because I don't wanna take any chances this time. And I kept spraying this down occasionally to keep the top wet the whole time. And we have no cracks in the top. Really nice looking casting. So I'm gonna put the electric heater back in after I get done with this metal work. We're gonna go from there. All right, we've had this thing run out at a thousand watts for a couple of days now, and it's steadying out at about 350 degrees internal temp. So we may have even removed some of the chemically locked water. It is now safe to go ahead and start the fire curing process. We have a blower and the burner set up. We're gonna wheel this thing outside and get ready for that. everybody good luck out there keep one thing in mind this stuff is extremely toxic any silica bearing material can mess your lungs up pretty bad and it can give you cancer I can't remember the name of the cancer scoliosis or silicosis or something like that but you cannot breathe in this dust when I'm working with it I'll typically set up a fan that's blowing air on me so I have positive air blowing past me and all the dust particles and stuff are blowing away from me. So definitely work with a fan messing with this stuff. Even if you have a breathing mask on, those breathing masks aren't fail safe. They don't totally protect you. They, they just kind of do. If you're shaved and all that stuff, you know, and it's a tight fit, then yeah. I mean, nonetheless, I forgot to point that out in the beginning of how toxic that stuff is when you're mixing it up. You can't just go throwing this stuff into a bucket and mix it. I use a uh, very powerful drill and a auger bit to mix it with. If you do have to do a large amount of this and you go to rent a machine mixer, don't get one of the ones that just spins where the whole tumbler turns. That's not gonna work for refractory. You have to have a paddle wheel mixer because of the low water content required um, a rotating mixer won't mix this stuff at the low water content. It will force you to put too much water into it. So avoid those type of mixers. And if I think of any other details, I'll put them down in the comments. I do actually have a couple in mind regarding phosphorus type refractories and why you would use one refractory type over another. There are acidic refractories that have acids in them that, um, 
help combat high CO partial pressure gas environments and things like that, low iron content in them, stuff like that. And then there's phosphorus bonded materials that I believe may be for the high sulfur content environments. So I'll have to check about that detail, but I know the phosphor bond requires, um, you heat it up to 600 degrees and then that's the minimum. If you let it cool back down before any of it has hit 600 degrees during the curing for some reason, it'll reabsorb water. So you really got to know the composition of your refractory. This isn't really a one size fits all situation. Some of the things are, for example, the slump test seems to be universal across the board. If it ain't thick enough to make a ball out of it, you're playing with fire. It'll still make a refractory. It's just going to be soft and it'll break easy and your forms might tear it apart. And another thing I learned was um, you really got to give that stuff some time before you tear your forms off if they're intricate. The form release agent did work well just the baby oil and Vaseline. They sell the stuff online for probably a lot more than that stuff costs. So I don't think I'll be buying form release anytime soon. I'm totally validating the baby oil Vaseline mixture. But that's all I got, man. That's, I've taken up enough of your time. I'm shutting up.